In this video, we're going to set up an IBM Security Directory server using TLS and certificates for both client and server communication. So if this is our client and this is our server, the traditional way for the two to talk is that the client will contact STS over TCP port 389, and this is an unsecure or an insecure connection. And by that, I mean the communication is plain text. Now, by itself, that's not necessarily bad. If you open up an LDAP browser like this one, it comes with internet public servers and you can find these online. All of this information is already publicly available. And you can see that communication happens on port 389. And if you look at this book, you can see that DNS is actually the largest public directory deployed in the world. And in fact, what happened was it beat Wins, which was a Microsoft product, it beat X.500, and it beat LDAP. And at the time, these four products were all vying for that position as the largest directory. But not all information is public, and therefore not all of it should be communicated in plain text. So you have an option of using a separate port called 636 or the LDAP secure port, which is known as LDAP S, and this is just LDAP. So you might be wondering, well, who cares? Well, some information inside your directory should simply never be communicated in plain text, including some emails and especially passwords that should never go across plain text on any communication channel. Now in SDS, you can eliminate 389. So no data will be transferred in plain text. And you can do that in open LDAP as well. But interestingly, you cannot do that in Active Directory. You must, in Active Directory, allow 389 to be running. And in Active Directory, you can reject a simple bind, which means transferring a username and password in clear text. And that's accomplished through something called Start TLS. And all that means is that the client will connect over to 389 over plain text and then issue a command called Start TLS, which will then continue the communication using TLS, which is encrypted and SDS allows start TLS. And that matters because this LDAP S approach using 636 is now considered deprecated. You can see it's been deprecated since 2003 as explained in RFC 3494. That said, 636 is extremely common, so you'll probably see it. According to open LDAP, there is no difference between LDAP S and start TLS from a security standpoint. So let's start with this approach because it's still fairly common and because it's useful to understand how we can later follow the standard by using start TLS. So as we've seen in previous videos, I'm going here and I'll open the IAT. I'm going to start from scratch by creating a new instance. It'll be default, I'll click next, type in my passwords, click next and finish. The next step is actually one of the hardest and it's to locate the correct page in the documentation to set up TLS. And this is the page despite the somewhat odd title. Now, before we follow that, let's open up our TCP IP settings and then click next and notice our defaults 389 and 636. Both of those ports are mentioned extensively in this document. Now in IBM terminology, GSK stands for Global Security Kit. It's the equivalent of the OpenSSL library. And this command is the equivalent of the OpenSSL command. Now that matters because it is going to create our certificate. And in this example, GSKit will create the certificate that we give to SDS. Then SDS will provide the certificate to anyone requesting access on either of the two ports. SDS also allows the client to have a certificate and for the server to check the certificate on the client. And that is called mutual authentication, but we won't be doing that for simplicity in this example. So in other words, the client must trust this certificate and it must already trust the certificate prior to this interaction with the server. And if the certificate is actually a child, that means a parent certificate will also be on the SDS machine then the client must trust the parent and by implication, it will trust the child. Now in this example, we'll just have a single certificate, which means it is a child and a parent and they're the same thing. And if you open up these certificates, you'll see that the parent is always called the issuer and the child is always called the subject. So let's scroll down here. We're going to set up server authentication. That means not mutual. Now, the first step is to create a directory for your keys, but we first need to be in the account where this will happen. So let's switch into that account. Now, notice if you do an echo shell, we see the corn shell as we explained in a previous video, and that means the control R won't work properly. And there's some other issues. So I personally like bash, so we'll be using that. So now we can do step one. Let's make a directory called keys and we'll CD into keys and I'll clear off my screen and we'll copy this command and we'll paste it in. 
and this will create a new key database called this with this password and create a file with an obscured version of the password called stashed. And now we can ls that. This is the certificate revocation list. This is the actual database or key store as it's often called. This holds any certificate signing requests if you want a third party like VeriSign or Symantec to sign one of the keys in that database. And this is the stash file, which holds an obscured version of the password, which you can confirm by doing a cat on that file. Now at this point, we only have keys. We do not have any certificates. Step three will create a self-signed certificate. So I'll copy that and paste it. And this will use the database that we mentioned before with that password, and it will create a new certificate with a label, which is this, and we need to change that. It will also mark that certificate as being the default in the store. The CN needs to be the host name of the server that you're on. Now, I'm just using the short name here, but in practice, you would use the fully qualified domain name. Okay, and we'll hit enter. At this point, our key database has a private key. We created that when we created the database. It has a public key that comes along with it. And then we have a certificate, which we did in this step. And the certificate was signed by the private key of this database. And it then turned around and used its public key as certification of that signature. That means that the issuer and the subject are the same and we have a self-signed certificate. And you can confirm that with a command like this, which tells you we do have a certificate it is a default certificate and the dash indicates personal. Personal is a Java term. It means there is a public and a private key inside it. And in step four, it wants us to extract out the certificate itself. So I'll go ahead and do that. And now if I do an LS, we see this DER file and that takes us to step five and things here are starting to get interesting. So first off, we need to create this file here. So I'm going to type this command and I'm going to copy and paste it in here. And this file takes us to the DN of CN equals SSL, CN equals configuration. This is the heart of all of the configuration changes you can make with SSL. And you'll see that it repeats over and over and over again. And just to be clear, SSL here really means TLS in today's terminology. And you can see what this LDIF is trying to do. We're going to be modifying this entry. We're going to replace it with this value. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, we know it is an attribute. It comes to the left of the colon and the values are provided on the right. The two values that we have here are server client auth. That would be mutual authentication, which we're not doing. And the second option is server auth, which is the typical server providing authentication. We're giving the key database to the server and the client will either trust or not trust it. The next one is really important and it's described here on the left but their explanation is a little confusing if you've never done this before. Notice that all the options are some combination of SSL and TLS. And what they mean by that is, remember, this is the older approach. It is deprecated and it is SSL. And this is the newer approach when you're using TLS. So this is start TLS. So if you choose SSL, you're actually choosing this and this, but only in the plain text version, not start TLS. And if you choose SSL only, choosing the most secure option because this port becomes enabled, but this one won't enable at all. And if you choose SSL TLS, you really are choosing all the options, meaning LDAP S636 and 389, both plain text and start TLS. And lastly, if you just choose TLS, then LDAP S or 636 won't enable and 389 will. And that means both plain text and start TLS. So if you're looking for a pattern here, essentially what you should see is that anytime you enable 389, you are also enabling both plain text and start TLS. And of course, if you've enabled 636, then no plain text will possibly go into that port. So this comes down to how much do you trust your clients? Could your clients at some point, any client ever send plain text? If the answer is no, then 389 is probably fine. But if it's more realistic that that answer is a yes, then 636 is probably better. Another option is to simply reject all simple bind, which means login requests at the server. So although the password would have been sent in plain text, it would not be accepted by the server. The next attribute is much simpler. It's just saying, where is your key database? 
The next attribute is also simple. It's just asking you what is the label. And that's the label on the certificate, which we saw earlier here. And the next one wants to know what is our password. Now, this is a glaring security hole. You don't want to keep your passwords in plain text in a file. But remember, when we did our stashed command earlier, that will keep the password available in GSKit available for SDS. So you can completely remove this section and the password will be brought in from the stashed file. So I removed mine. Now, this sample page on the left doesn't give us all of the security options that you're more likely to use. And for that information, you really want to go to this page. Because from a security standpoint, you should be using TLS 1.2 and nothing less unless you have a particular requirement. So to enforce that, you use the attribute SIPD security protocol and set it to TLS 1.2. Then for your SSL extensions, you can use something like this, and I'm using AES for CypherSpec. Now, why those values in particular? If you run this open SSL command and you ask it for the high strength ciphers, you get this list back and they're sorted essentially in order of strength. And this one here, you can see it's using AES and it's using SHA-384 for its fingerprints and elliptical key Diffie-Hellman exchange with RZA for its keys. And that's a pretty good option. So here is the value inside of SDS you can use to approximate those. And indeed the SHA-512 is even higher. Now, the same web page will give you an idea what the combinations of SSL and TLS will actually do when you use them. Now, the Z option equals SSL. This is the older deprecated version. And the dash Y option is the start TLS option. It's the newer one. And that explains why yes is enabled only for SSL and why yes is enabled here for the Y option because of the presence of TLS. Now, this one is confusing. It's listed twice. That means it's essentially yes in both columns. Also, LDIF files are really sensitive to spaces. So be careful that you've got spaces after the colon. And at the end of the file, it's probably best to leave it like this without a trailing space or line break. Okay, so save that file. And now we can go back to step five. I'll copy this and then I will paste it in, but I'm going to change the host name to this and then hit enter. And this is the first problem with that page. You need to remember add keys as they told us to do. And of course you can see that down here as keys. And if you get this error, you need to make sure your server is running. And you can see mine is stopped. So click on start and click start server. And notice too, it says non SSL port initialized to 389, which means we can use port 389. I will rerun the command and then we need to stop and then start the server, which you can use these commands to do or the GUI. Now I installed as root, so I can't do those commands under this account. So I'll do them under the root account and then I'll go ahead and run the start command here as well. And notice we have both 389 and 636 enabled. And you can confirm that by doing an SS, which looks at the ports using these options. And I'll grep for the daemon running LDAP and then grep for listen. And sure enough, those are the two ports. Now let's confirm that with an LDAP search. Now, first of all, in IBM, you can precede this optionally with IDS. Now, remember that Y refers to TLS, H refers to the host name. Now, you can use just a host name or you can give this syntax. So in other words, you could do host name like this and in the port you can list as such, except that this P needs to be a lowercase p for port. Next one is interesting. That's a dash K. This gives it the key database. The D option, remember, is for the bind DN. Then we give it the password with a W. S is for a scope. Remember, these are the options there. Dash B, so we're looking at the root DSE here for the base. And then we have the object class, which is star. The plus is for operational characteristics, which means additional data that you normally wouldn't see with these sorts of things. So here's a quick open LDAP explanation of that plus sign. And then let's hit enter. And notice that we get an error. Now, why is this? It should be somewhat clear. Well, remember that we used IBM SLAPD security and we set that to SSL. The definition of SSL is 636 and 389 unsecured, but no start TLS. And Y refers to start TLS, which we don't have, and so we get an error. Z, on the other hand, is SSL. So let's change the Y to a Z and try again. Now, here we're getting an error but that's because we're trying port 389, but we're using Z, which doesn't make sense because we don't have start TLS. Remember, Z is used with 636, so we need to switch this to 636. So here we go. We'll try again. There we go. Also, that plus I was talking about, I'm going to take that off. Look at the difference in the results. 
So the plus, you can see these additional operational attributes they're called. Now, this SSL option also allows us to accept 389, so let's try that. Remember, this did not work from before, and there were two reasons for that. The first reason is that we were using a dash at Z, so if we try that, it still doesn't work. And the second reason is because we are providing a key file, so let's take that out. Okay, so that's gone, and hit enter, and there we go. So in the same vein, let's look at SSL only. So I'll change this, SSL becomes SSL only. Now I will rerun this command. Now I want to rerun those restart commands. So to do that, I will type FC and then start with the first one, 1005. And then the last one, this is specific to what I'm doing. And then just exit out of here and it will run those restart commands. And notice in the output, no 389, only 636. And you can confirm with that same command. So now what do you think would happen if I reran this command and it's on port 389? And hopefully that error should make sense. We're not running 389 anymore. So let's change this to the next option, which is SSL TLS. And we'll exit out. So now we want to modify this, but we're going to have a problem because we can't connect on port 389. But we know SSL only will accept 636. And we know that 636 is a Z. And there we change that. And we know that our key database looks like that. And we'll try it again. Now, I'm getting an error there because this command is very picky, of course, and you have to have the D in the right place. And there we go. And I'll go ahead and restart the server. And there we see 389 and 636. And because this is the option that essentially chooses everything, we should be able to repeat the last search we did, and it should work. Or we can try a previous search, which uses Z, and that should work. So a few seconds ago, we tried the just plain vanilla 389 without the key and using Z. But now let's try start TLS with capital Y and see if that works. And it does. And then lastly, let's try just TLS. So we'll go in here, change that to TLS. And, and we'll do an LDAP modify, a start TLS LDAP modify. And there we go. And we'll restart the server. Notice this time only 389. And we can confirm that. And we'll try a search that's start TLS. That works. And we'll try a plain text connection. And that also works. Now, remember we asked, do we trust these clients to send a start TLS command? Well, here's an example where it matters. Remember, we're able to accept 389 both start TLS and plain text. But I don't have a start TLS option. I have an SSL option, but by default, that's going to change the port anyway to 636. So if I force 389 over SSL, that is going to give us an error. So this client isn't trustworthy enough to send start TLS. It's not capable of doing it. So instead, it is going to send 389, and that's going to go right through. And that means we just sent the credentials. This screen here, which is masking our password, is actually more secure than what we just did. So hopefully that helps explain how you set up TLS with IBM's security directory server 6.4.